Uh, all right, everyone, uh, let's get started. So it's my great pleasure uh, to uh, welcome our colloquium speaker today, Professor Richard Ladner. Uh, so Richard is a professor emeritus in the Allen School. Emeritus, I think, only in a title, because uh, he doesn't seem to be slowing down in doing amazing research with his students, you know, past students and other collaborators. Uh, so Richard, I was actually just talking with him, joined the Allen School in 1971. So he was one of the first exciting junior hires into computer science and engineering back when it was just starting as a computer science group under the graduate school, so uh, very exciting. Uh, at that time, Richard was a theoretical computer scientist, and he, uh, he did this work for the first 35 years of his career. Then he moved to become an accessibility researcher for an additional 18 years. What's actually interesting is I joined exactly 18 years ago, so from my perspective, Richard, you've always been an accessibility researcher doing just really exciting work in the space, and Richard really put the Allen School uh, on the map in terms of research and accessibility. Uh, and it's really amazing to me when I look at how strong we are today, building on all the great work that Richard started with all the different centers and initiatives uh, around campus. So very, very exciting. Uh, so Richard was the principal investigator for access computing from 2006 until very recently, 2024, uh, when he uh, just stepped down from this role. So access computing is a really major uh, initiative and alliance that aims to increase the participation of people with disabilities uh, in computing fields by doing two things, direct interventions to support computing students with disabilities, and also by increasing the capacity of computing educators, employers, and organizations to include people with disabilities. And this is really important because when you know more citizens can participate, when everyone, all those different you know, uh, perspectives can participate, we all benefit. Uh, from the result. So over time, Richard expanded as access computing to have truly national scope uh, with members including 70 CS departments, 25 organizational departments, and 17 industry partners. So this work resulted actually in Richard being called the conscience of the computer science community, which is a really cool, really cool title. Uh, so Richard worked on uh, you know, many other things. Um, including accessibility, disability issues even before access computing, uh, including with the partners that do it, running summer camps, uh, computing, um, um uh, summer camps for students with disabilities, advising PhD students with disabilities, giving advice to many other at institutions across the country. And Richard has really been recognized for this work with many awards, um, uh, including the 2020 National Science Board Public Service Award, the 2016 SIG Access Award for Outstanding Contributions to Computing and Accessibility, the 2014 SIGCHI Social Impact Award, and the 2008 Computing Research Association A. Nico Haberman Award. Uh, so he's also a fellow of the ACM, IEEE, AAAS. So we're just so excit uh, excited to have Richard with us today. And thank you so much for all those contributions over many years, and again, for putting us on the map for this extremely important work. Uh, thank you, Magda. Uh, well, it's great to be here, and this is kind of my swan song for access computing because I recently stepped down as the principal investigator, of the, and that's the NSF jargon for the, you know, the head or whatever of access computing. And I couldn't do this alone, of course. I had many people that uh, supported this and did a lot more than I have at accumulating all of them, but I'm, I'm kind of focus on some of the things I've done uh, with access computing. So I have like this talk is in like four parts. The first part is just what is access computing because you might, you heard a little bit from Magda, but I wanna go a little more depth uh, into that. Then what is the impact of access computing? And then what about the future of access computing? I think it's in really good hands, by the way, with uh, Maya Kakmak. And finally, I just some acknowledge, acknowledgments to the people that really supported me through the process. So let me start. So what is access computing? Well, this is one way to look at it. It's just a bunch of money uh, from <laughs> the National Science Foundation, five grants uh, over, uh, I don't know, 18 years. Um, and they overlap because you kind of have a little money left from one grant, but then the next one comes in and you have, you know, so the, the years kind of overlap. And it all adds up to about $15.5 million over 18 years. So it was a significant amount of money from NSF, a big investment. Now, access computing isn't the only 
uh, broadening participation in computing alliance. There are, I think, 11 other ones now. In the early days, uh, there were probably about eight alliances, and access computing is one of the survivors, one of three or four of the original, um, the original broadening uh, participation in computing alliances. And Magda mentioned the, these goals uh, of access computing. The first is to increase the participation of people with disabilities in computing careers. And the second is to serve as a catalyst and national resource to help make educational and career opportunities in computing fields more welcoming and accessible for people with disabilities. So that's a sort of institutional change. By the way, I do have these pictures. Oops. Oh, I'm going the wrong direction. OK. I'm getting used to this little bugger. Um, so we have uh, a bunch of strategies uh, that we use, high-level strategies. One is individual engagement with disabled students, uh, faculty around the nation, and organizations around the nation, particularly organizations that deal with people in some way or another, because within any group, there are going to be people with disabilities. Um, organizational capacity development was talked about earlier. So that's with competing departments, competing organizations, and industry. Curriculum development, uh, trying to change the curriculum of computer science to be more accessible in its own right, and also to teach about accessibility, because that's needed in industry, and there are a number of other reasons for having teaching accessibility. We also talk about universal design uh, for learning. And then alliance impact and sustainability. Even after funding, we want something left, which will be all the resources that we have. And then develop new leaders. And we've done all those things. The lead organizations are the first one. The first three are University of Washington, uh, the Paul G. Allen School, the Information School, and the Dewitt Center. And the Dewitt Center is a center that's been around since about 1994 or 93, and it's supporting basically students with disabilities. And it's kind of a lot of the similar goals to access computing, but it's a broader, it's beyond computing. Um, and then we have Tufts, UC Irvine, and, and Gallaudet. Gallaudet is the only well, full-scale university for deaf people. The interpreter can't hear me. Can you hear me now, interpreter? OK, great. Um, and here are the leaders. Myself, of course, the PI, and then the new PI, um, Maya Kakmak, uh, and all the co-PIs that we've had over time. Cheryl Bergstar is the first one. Uh, Brianna Blazer, Elaine Short from Tufts. By the way, uh, Cheryl Bergstaller and Brianna are from the Dewitt Center. Um, Stacy Braunham from UC Irvine, Amy Coe from the iSchool, uh, Raja Kushal Nagar from Gallaudet, and Jake Roebuck, Roebuck from uh, the iSchool. And here's kind of the timeline for everybody in that group. I w me and Cheryl Burksteller were there from the beginning. Um, and then Brianna joined us in about 2011. And then Amy Coe and Jake Wobrock around 2015. And Jake went on and did something new in his own right. But Amy stayed on. That's fantastic. And then our new uh, co-PIs, Raja, Stacy, and Elaine came on in 2021 and are going to continue. So little dot, dot, dots means that those are the people that are going to continue. And Maya, you're just a tiny little blip there right now. but. I expect that to be a long, a long line eventually. And of course, we've had additional funders like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Johnson Scholarship Foundation, Google, GitHub, Microsoft, Info Infosys, Foundation USA, and Fencer Institute. And most of these have been funding sp very specific things and not just general funding. So some of the projects I'm going to talk about uh, coming up. So I had to go back 
before access computing. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it at the very beginning, but I need to sort of set the stage for how access computing came into being. And my sister here is in the audience, so she knows a lot of stories. And she's in this picture uh, of my family from 1946. Um, she's the baby. And, uh, and my older sister, who right now has dementia, is in memory care. My twin brother, who died 11 years ago, he had schizophrenia. And my sister, who is crazy good, um, <laughs> really good person. And that's me in the front when I had black hair. And my parents are in the background. Now, my parents, they looked like just regular parents, but they were actually disabled. They were both deaf, and they used sign language as their primary language. And uh, you know, I got to sort of get engaged with the deaf community at a very early age. Um, so that's kind of the, one of the backstories uh, of how I got involved. So I had disability kind of in my blood um, from the very beginning. And my parents were very, how can I put it? They were very deaf with a capital D. That is, they believed that you know, they were more of a linguistic uh, minority rather than a disability minority because they used sign language. And so they were, a, a, if you like, deaf proud is the way to think about it. And my sister might agree with me with that. And then, you know, I arrived here in 1971, and I got involved with things around deaf people mostly. Um, uh, I did some tutoring of deaf kids at the Eckstein School Middle School and at Roosevelt High School. And uh, I actually did tutoring in Logo of all the, you know, if anybody remembers Logo, only the old people would. Um, I volunteered in the deaf-blind community. I volunteered as a support service provider, so I, I would guide uh, deaf-blind people to the grocery store or the bank and help them do their transactions and buying things. So I got a, a really good taste of uh, everyday deaf-blind people and volunteered for the American Association for the Deaf-Blind Convention that was held right here at UW in 1984. And I have a lot of stories about that, but I'm, I, it's, it's just too long to tell. It was very fascinating. Um, and I'm a supporter of the Washington State Deafblind Citizens Organization, which is an organization that was founded maybe about 1980. And they were the kind of the sponsors of this AADB convention. Um, I was on the founding board of the Deafblind Service Center uh, in Seattle, which was, I think, about 1985, approximately. Uh, and I'm also was on an advisory board for the Abused Deaf Women's Advocacy Services, and I made many deaf friends uh, in these activities. And all the logos for those are shown on this slide. Now, the big thing that happened to me uh, was, you know, I knew a lot about deaf people, but I didn't know about other disabilities. But luckily, I did. I got it through working with the Do It Center in their Do It Summer Study Program. I know, uh, Maya has also done this. I did it for 10 years, and Maya, I don't think you've done 10 years yet, but four years, <laughs> she signed to be four. Uh, so it's one of these do-it programs for high school students held two weeks in every summer, about since 1994. And it's in three phases. Uh, one phase is juniors um, come in before they, you know, before they become seniors, and they kind of learn about, they stay at the University of Washington, in the dorms, they learn about being in a dorm, and they learn lots of other things about, you know, things that the things they learned about are the things they talked about in their in a survey below: preparation for college, internet skills, preparation for employment, self-advocacy skills, computer skills, things like that. So just getting ready for college, this transition. And then the second year, were they came back for a second year, and they did a project. And that's where I got involved, in the phase two. And then the third year were interns. And so the big group was the first phase. A smaller group was the second one. And then the third one was even smaller. And this was a winner. This Do It Summer Study was the winner for the 1997 uh, Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring, which is a prestigious award that's given to by the President of the United States. So that, you know, 
this is a very important thing. Well, I got involved in this um, with something called the Game of Life and Image Processing Workshop that I started, I think, in 1996 and completed about 1995 before access computing started. And over that time, I worked with 48 students all with all kinds of disabilities. And because I got to learn about these other disabilities and their needs and their wants and desires, that it's, it broadened my scope of not just deaf and deaf blind, but everybody who has a disability. And I'm still learning, by the way. <laughs> it's not something that I just learned and it's gone. I'm still learning. And it was a 15 hour a week, for, 15 hours for one week. And they all did a project in this Game of Life platform that was developed by Jim Fix, a former graduate student of mine, who's now a professor at Reed College in, in Portland, Oregon. And then after Jim left, Tammy, DeGriff, Tammy Vandegrift took over and assisted me with this as well. And so I had some great help from, from graduate students and actually a lot of other students as well, as I'll explain in a moment. And so in all the work I've done, I've always included students because actually they do the hard work and I can just direct. No, it's not quite true, but um, that's kind of the idea. So here's a picture of the Game of Life platform. And if anybody knows about the Game of Life, it's, it's just a little funny game. It's invented by this guy Conway. And if you look around you, you're a cell. That's a little square here. You're a little cell. You look around yourself. And if there are the right number of people alive around you, you become alive. If there's too many or too few around you, you die. And that's the code that's shown here. And all the Game of Life workshop did, did was just modify this code to do other things or play the game. And this particular game, this particular setup for the Game of Life is called the glider gun. And it produces these little things that go off to the, that, to the right there and down. And it does that forever if it's on an infinite grid. But since this thing has wrap around, it comes around and kills itself. So um, it's very techy. But here's some of the ideas for projects that that student did on those, those 48 students. On the upper left would be kind of like a, something for tactile graphics that you could convert a map into something tactile, but you have to have kind of a simple design. And that's the center of campus, the UW campus. The next one on the right there is kind of a game that was invented by one of those students. One of those dots, the green dot is the predator, and the other dot is the prey. The prey moves randomly, and the predator has to find it. So the game player is, the, is playing the red dot, but not the yellow dot. And of course, there are barriers and things like that you can't go through. And then on the far right is something it's a conversion of a grayscale image to a black and white image using what's called dithering and a little algorithm that you have to implement. All these things can be implemented in the game of life. And there's a, a line drawing of me. So it's an it's, it's edge detection algorithm, which you can also do on the game of life. And then the one in the center there in the bottom is kind of a, just a design, just an artistic design that somebody accidentally uh, made. So these are kind of examples. And I think we had about 15 or 20 different things. This is just a subset of those. And here's a picture of uh, the workshop. On the left there um, is a student working, uh, a do it student or do it summer study student, uh, working with one of the volunteers that worked with me, uh, one of the students. And I wish I could remember his name. I think he was an undergraduate. So every Every one of my do it students would have an assistant who would work with them. They would never touch the computer, but they would help them problem solve. And I kind of learned that technique in the first year when I had to do everything myself. And I couldn't, couldn't handle this, too many people to, to work with. And on the right, of course, I would work with students as well. So on the right, I'm working with a student there. And those are kind of a memorable computers there, but they were pretty powerful. So that was the lab in Sieg Hall. And they always sent me a thank you card. So this was uh, two, uh, 1999, and these are the five students I worked with in 1999. They put little notes on there. Hey, Rich, it was fun. Hope that we meet again sometime. 
in the future to share experiences together. Signed, and I can't read a signature. <laughs> so the kid on the bottom right has cerebral palsy, so his writing isn't quite perfect, but that's OK. So 2005, that was kind of the end of my work with the Do It uh, summer study. Um, but you can see the effect it had on me. It, the effect was I went way beyond deaf people and deaf blind people to all disabilities. Well, not quite all, but to many other disabilities. Um, but 2005 was a pivotal year. So what happened then? So there's kind of a little story here. 2005 was the beginning of the NSF size, that's the Computer and Information Science and Engineering program at NSF. Broadening Participation in Computing program started. And I, of course, I didn't know anything about it, except that I did talk to Peter Freeman. I happened to be in Washington, DC, and he, I think he introduced me to Ed Jan Cooney that day, sometime around in 2005. Why was I in Washington, DC? I can't remember. But um, anyway, uh, the solicitation for this new program came out, but I didn't see it. Cheryl Bergstaller saw it. She's the director of the Do It Center at University of Washington. And of course, she knew me, and I'm in CSE. This is computing, so who did she call? Me. I said, hey, would you be interested in writing a grant with me to, to this new program? And it didn't take me long to say yes. I mean, I just, yeah, I thought about it for five minutes. I didn't tell my wife. Uh, I probably should have. Um, but that got me into it. So we wrote a proposal, and it, it made it. And so it was the first one on that list. It started in 2006. So that's kind of the story. And that, our, this Jan Cooney person is here at the University of Washington. She's right here in the audience. And she is, I don't know what your title is exactly, but you're some director of some kind of diversity thing at University of Washington. So I've known her a long time. So now I'll get to the impact of access computing. And I want to say ahead of time that this is my perspective, but I've been you know, talking with uh, Maya and Brianna Blazer who are here in the audience, the, 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 the leaders, the current leaders of access computing, uh, about the next proposal. I'm just sort of advising them. And, uh, and so they're going to have a site visit in three or four weeks for the next proposal. I'm not involved in that, but they are. And they were talking about you know, what, you know, this impact. And I think they're going to borrow some of my slides. So we'll see. But again, this is my perspective. And Brianna and other people that were on the project might think of other things that were important to them. So I did have some kind of guiding principles for the way I thought about access computing. One was disability is everywhere. It's not like siloed. It's everywhere. Every other disability cuts across all other demographics. There's black people who are disabled, Hispanic people, women are disabled, men are disabled, you know, non-binary disabled, on and on. And so disability has to be part of, it, it can't be siloed. It's part of these other intersectional uh, minorities. Disability data is inconsistent and not very common. And so we kind of worked on that as an important thing is to get, let's find out what's actually happening. And I'll talk a lot more about data later. Accessibility is not often taught. So it's just not part of the college experience in most universities and colleges. But that's changing uh, slowly, and hopefully from access computing. And compliance is not enough. Universities, they want to comply with the law. And if that's the attitude of the university, I wouldn't say it's a welcoming place because compliance is really not enough. You want to be welcoming. You want to have you know, at a place where people with disabilities or disabled people can thrive. And then systematic change is hard. That Nothing changes overnight. You have to work on this for a long period of time. And we've done 18 years so far, but it's not over. So those are kind of my, the principles in my head. Um, so I'm going to talk about first the impact on students. And here we've had a lot of impact, and this will be kind of a, a small piece of that. OK. 
and this thing might have died. Um, so we have something called the Access Computing Team, which is students. Computing students with disabilities apply to become Access Computing Team members. And when they apply, they don't need any documentation. They just say, I identify as disabled, and that's good enough. So there is an application process. And the benefits are they get peer, there's a, they join immediately a peer, net, uh, peer mentoring network. So they talk with, with each other on a, on a listserv. They learn about opportunities of interest to them that are maybe specific to students with disabilities or even broader opportunities. Um, we have webinars. Uh, we fund them to go to conferences. And we're funding uh, summer research experiences. So they're the main benefits for the Access Competing Team. And uh, here's some of the demographics. And this is since 2015 to now. Uh, within the Access Computing Team, it's been almost 1,500 students have been a member. Some of them are in the room. Um, about 2% high school, uh, about three quarters are college students, you know, four year colleges or community colleges, and 25% are graduate students. They're about half men, a third women, a third, excuse me, 3% other. And the 17 didn't respond to that, 17%. Race, ethnicity, it's pretty, pretty what you might expect uh, from anything. Because remember, I talked about disability cuts across all other demographics. And it sort of shows up in our, our data here. So it's about 10% for Hispanic and black Af African American, 22% Asian, and 51% 50, white. And then disability type, we ask them about disability type. Uh, kind of on the basis of their high school type of disability. So this is IDEA. Um, and you can see that it's everything. And I just wanted to point out a few that, I've, that I put asterisks on. The percent that we have of vision impaired or blind, uh, mobility impaired, or hearing, that is deaf or hard of hearing, uh, those are higher percentages than you would find in the population. So. I think that reflects the fact that they get a lot out of it. And that might change over time, but that's what we've had over the last uh, 10 years or so. And then student activities, I have four categories here. One is uh, research experiences, and we've had, over the last 10 years, 111 do that. And they do this with faculty members around the country. Uh, they don't do it with us. Um, and it's through the CRAWP. Drew program through REU site program at Gallaudet and the Dub REU program here at the University of Washington. Um, we do career development workshops for grad students. We send them to the Ideals workshop. And about 20% of students that go to the Ideals workshop, and this is run by CRAWP, uh, have a disability. And then the Academic Careers workshop, we send them there, and it's about 10%. And for academic careers workshop, that's not just students, but actually uh, faculty members as well. Um, conference attendance, we've sent about 200 students during this period to different conferences like the uh, Tapia Celebration, and a Diversity and Computing, and Grace Hopper Celebration, CSUN, Assistive Technology Conference, and, and also research area conferences. We've sent some students to Europe uh, to go to a conference. And then we have our, you know, our uh, student webinars, and we've had about 100 of those. So that's like applying to grad school, disability uh, disclosure, and other, other topics that students are interested in, students with disabilities. So and then we've run our own workshops as well. So we had this summer academy I'm going to talk about in more depth. For seven years, we did that. We had the Saturday competing experience for deaf and hard of hearing that ran for three years, a workshop for emerging deaf and hard of hearing scientists at Gallaudet in 2012, a National Federation of the Blind, USLAM, we did that for two years, uh, empowering blind students in science and engineering workshop in 2014, and the Our CS Plus Access Computing, UW Plus Access Computing workshop we had here in this new building. It was just a brand new building. Uh, in 2018, and then during the pandemic, 
We had another one with the, the Create Center here at the University of Washington. So these are workshops that we ran ourselves uh, for the most part. The one at Gallaudet, we, wor we worked cooperatively with uh, the people at Gallaudet. So I want to talk specifically about the Summer Academy because this is kind of a, it was a big part of my life for seven years. It's not a little program. It's a nine-week program in the summer. Um, all the students took a computing class, you know, intro computing, or sometimes we sent them to community college to the Python course over there, which was a lot more accessible than, than our intro course. Um, they did it for credit. They did an animation project with students of uh, Barbara Moniz, and that was a, they used professional uh, animation tools to do that. Um, we brought in deaf role models from around the country, uh, faculty members and other professionals who are deaf in the computing field. And they gave lectures and stayed around for a couple of days to talk with the students in individual consultations. And we, had, we visited local companies, Microsoft, Google, Adobe, and so on. They really loved going to Valve uh, because it's a game company. Uh, he didn't like it. <laughs> um, and uh, we also went to Microsoft Xbox game place where they actually got to do some practice. I'm not supposed to tell you they did that, but we signed an NDA to go there. Um, and then during those seven years, we had 81 students go through the program. Actually, 83 came to the program. Two had to leave for one reason or another. And among the 81, uh, 60 were men and 21 were men, women. They were all. Uh, uh, races and ethnicities from 27 different states, uh, 60 for high school students, and 21 were college students. So it was weighted toward high school students. The youngest student we had was, I think, 16. and was a sophomore in high school. And I just remember her because she really went on. She went, and got, she went to the University of Minnesota, got her degree there, and did some interning at NASA. And now she still works for NASA. And she's kind of an amazing young woman. And the outcomes are, I know of, 35 that got bachelor's degrees, 11 got master's degrees, five got PhDs, and one got an MD. So they're a doctor. And, uh, so, I'm gonna... and so they came from all over the country. So in this picture, the, the, home, the homes of these people are the little upside down teardrops. And then the schools, they, the colleges, the 21 that went to colleges are the little houses there, the school houses. So there, it was not just a little local program, but a national, national program. And here's a picture of 2012 group. You can see the ethnicities in there, the number of women and men, which is kind of what we had. And then uh, I wanted to point out Rob Roth, who was the director of the Summer Academy, he worked closely with me to make this a really good program. And he's still around, lives in Seattle, I see him quite often, so. And he's a deaf guy. Oh, this was a reunion, uh, there was a conference at, at, in Rochester, and we went over and got some of our former students together and just had a kind of a group hug um, at RIT in 2014. And I, I remember the names of maybe half of these people, but I can't remember them all. I know one in this picture works at Google, the one next to Raja on the far left. Oh, I had to highlight the, the sort of the PhDs, and uh, they're really fascinating, and the MD. So there's six of them. Uh, Lauren Fairovich, who was in our first class, he went and got a PhD in some biological field, and he started his own institute. Uh, on Global Deaf Research Institute. Um, and then these other years, Zhenji Chen uh, got a PhD at MIT. Uh, he's now at Boston College. Um, Daniel Seda got a PhD at UC Berkeley. And uh, he's in robotics, I see. Maya say, oh, I know that guy. Uh, he's now at USC as an assistant professor. Uh, Matthew Seda, his brother, younger brother, was in the same year. He got his PhD at RIT and is now a postdoc at, at Gallaudet. Uh, Deborah Diepenbrock got her MD at University of Kansas, is now at the University of Minnesota. 
and she does pediatrics. And then Abraham Glasser, who got his PhD at RIT, is now a professor, Gallaudet, assistant professor. I think this is his first year. So you know, it's kind of like I'm really proud of these people. Now I can't say my summer program was the one thing that got them going, but I think it helped. Okay, so that's the students. I didn't talk about all the impacts, but that's the ones that came to my mind. Now, the impact on competing departments, organizations, and industry. And I'll have some stories here as well. So we have partnerships, and they're a key part of access computing. So these partners, they join access computing partners, and they agree with our goals. And they promise to do something about advancing those goals. And we don't make them do certain things. We want them to do what they want to do. And so people do different things. Some people do uh, introduce a course on accessibility or include accessibility in a course. Others do other things. Uh, one of them has their own uh, neurodiversity program um, and so on. And so here's our 71 access computing academic partners. And, and they're all over the country. I think at about 30, about 30 states. Um, and um, um, for these 71 access computing academic partners, there's, there's representatives for each of these. So there might be multiple representatives for certain colleges and universities. And about 25 of these 107 have themselves a disability. So they have, they're not all faculty, but most of them are faculty. Some of them are uh, staff members. So it's kind of neat to see this growth. I was thinking back in 2015, we only had 21. We only had 21 uh, academic partners, and now we have 71. So we have 25 organizational partners. And I broke them into four groups, the BC, BPC alliances. Those are alliances like Access Computing, but have other groups they work with. Um, the K through 12, the people that work on K through 12, uh, three of those. And by the way, some of the alliances work on K through 12 as well. Uh, and disability-focused alliances like Access SIGCHI, um, Code the Spectrum, Create, uh, Disability in, and the Tasker Center here at the University of Washington. And then organizations looking to be more inclusive. And so that's the last group there, that they want to make sure that disability is included in their inclusivity. Uh, all of them are, are trying to make computer science more diverse. And then we have industry partners, 17 industry partners. And by the way, did I say how many of these partners we had in 2015? I think we had, I had the number in my notes. I think it's 17 or 12, one of those two. And then we didn't have any industry partners in 2015. That was a new program that we started. And now we have 17 industry partners. And among them are companies you know of, Salesforce, Microsoft, Yahoo, Uber, and Lyft. And some of these companies have somebody in their HR department who is interested in accessibility or including people with accessibility, excuse me, disabled people in their workforces. And then I wanted to highlight one of these that's really about disability. And this is the one called Our Ability. So I want to say a little bit, before I do that, I want to say a little bit more about uh, things beyond the partners, what we do beyond the partners. So we have community of practice, and they're just a mailing list that want to keep up with what we're doing and get the announcements that we send out about opportunities and things like that. So this is, um, the big one is the one for uh, computing faculty, administrators, and employers, 609 members. And the one that's just about broadening participation, 161 members. We have a website, and it gets about 300,000 views a year. There are 600 knowledge articles, and most of them are found by Google searches, not going to our website. Um, and so we try to keep those knowledge articles up to date. Um, We've written articles for CRA Computing News, uh, the NC Wit Rethink magazine, and we have a bun bunch of publications uh, at conferences like 
excuse me, at places like CACM, Communications of the ACM, Interactions of Respect, and SIGC conferences. And then we have sessions at lots of different conferences uh, where people that are interested in disability come, disability and accessibility. And we give out money, so up to $5,000 for a mini grant. And we've given out 101 of, 101 of those since 2015. So we're generous. And then I'm just, I want to talk about partner impacts because I feel like what we've done in access computing is generate this community of partners of various kinds, and they do things. So we don't, you know, we might give them some money in a mini grant, or, you know, we'll bat them on the back, but we got them going, and that's kind of the amplifier effect of access computing. Uh, so one of them is uh, teaching accessibility impact. So, and this is a new book uh, that just came out. It's a web-based book. Uh, it was led by Alana Olison, Amy Coe, and myself, although I did the least amount of work, I think, for it. Um, I, I wrote two chapters. I guess I did some work. Um, and it covers 14 CS courses and how you can include accessibility and disability in those courses. We had, 15, we had 21 different authors uh, for these 14 chapters. And, uh, 15 of them were already partners. So our partners are doing things. And they volunteered to do that. They weren't paid for this. They volunteered to do this. Um, so teaching, excel teaching accessibility impacts, we had two workshops that we ran in, in 2021 and 2023 on teaching accessibility, the one in 2021, which was during the pandemic. We had 60 attendees. About half were in, in person and half were um, online and then we did it again in 2023 and we had 40 attendees and that was all in person i think it was and then our partners had their own just this last uh, uh, 60 conference so they just did it on their own which is great um, and then we worked on curriculum standards and so we have an article on teaching accessibility as a curricular practice in the new ACM IEEE CS AAAI Curriculum 2023, which is the new advised curriculum for computer science uh, in the nation. Actually, it's in the world because ACM is a worldwide organization. And then ABET, which is the accreditation board for computing, uh, it's getting close. Uh, it's still in the proposal stage, and uh, it hasn't happened yet, but we hope that it will uh, in the next couple of years. But they're interested, more than interested. They actually helped put together a proposal that was not accepted. But someday it will be. And then disability data impacts. How have we helped with data collection? And I think our big win was the Talby survey. And everybody here who's in computer science heard about the Talby survey, which is the survey of computer science departments that are members of CRA, the Computing Research Association. So it's maybe 170 or 180 departments. So in 2021, at our urging, which I started in 2006, urging them to do it, but they didn't for all that time. And finally, they did it. And I think it was, they felt sorry for me. I don't know. But they, they finally did it. And, we had to pack them on the and we, we helped with develop the survey. You know, what were the right questions to ask? And the right question to ask was something was institutional data, not you wouldn't ask if anybody has a disability. We just wanted to know how many students received or were part of disability accommodations at their university. And so we'll just count that. Now there is a national number, which is eight percent, eight percent of all college students. Um, are registered with disability services at their college. And so what do they find for the PhDs, masters, and bachelor students? Well, for PhD, it's 1.1% are registered. Uh, masters, 1.5, and bachelors, uh, 4.1. And this is not all the institutions yet, but it's a, good, it's a good start. 56 did bachelors and 82 did PhDs and master 71. So 
we hope that all people will do this. Some people think you can't do it, but every university has to report this data to the government anyway. So they should tell everybody. It should be public. So, uh, and then our organizational partners who collect data about disability that didn't do it before, now do it. And CRAWP, the Tapia Conference, the Leap Alliance, ARC Network, the ACE Alliance, the STARS Computing Core Alliance, and RESPECT Conference. So these are all broadening participation in computing efforts in computer science. And they all collect data kind of using the guidelines that we gave them. And so it's kind of moving in the right direction. That, and why do we even need the data? Well, we want to know if there's progress. And the only way you know there's progress is if you have the data. And uh, so the, the, the CRA data, um, hopefully in 10 years, we'll know kind of the trends, what's happening. I wanted to talk about this one partner, uh, industry partner, Our Ability, which is kind of a, one of our newer partners. I think he's been on board maybe a year and a half or so. And uh, I've talked to them. So it's a site for disabled job seekers. So you're disabled and you want to look for a job, you can go to our ability. Uh, the founder is this guy, John Robinson, who is disabled himself. Um, he's a really interesting guy. And they use artificial intelligence to match job seekers with jobs. That sounds familiar. You know, this is like high tech. And so it's done in the humane way, though. It's not done to block out people. It's, it's trying to find the right match for disabled people. By the way, a lot of industries want dis disabled employees because they're such great employees. So it's not like, oh, it's not a sad story. It's, it's a positive story. And then Kartik, who is blind, uh, I met him when he was a student at Stanford, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. Um, he's the technology and product manager. So he's the guy that's making the AI for this, for this program. So he's a former Stanford student, and he was an Access Computing team member, and he's still a Microsoft employee. So this guy is kind of amazing. Uh, so it's so good to see, you know, one of our Access Computing team members, he was a team member when he was at Stanford, is now part of this company that's helping people with disabilities get jobs. And these are jobs that from companies who want those kind of employees. Now, there's a lot of things that are kind of access computing connected. I'm not going to say there's nothing causal here necessarily, but they are things that are going on that, not that we're responsible, they're not our impacts, but they are kind of like, I don't want to call them spin-offs. They're kind of like amplification effect, that we're helping them, they help us. It's kind of symbiotic. So Stacy Bronham, who's one of our co-PIs, is at University of California, Irvine. She's become an accessibility and disability leader at UC Irvine. She knows the president, the vice president, the deans. You know, Somehow she just moved up the chain and has become kind of a leader there. And it's kind of amazing to see. Elaine Short uh, uh, is an accessibility and disability leader in the human robot interaction community. And I think Maya can attest to that. And so she's just made that her mission is to get this um, um, robot interaction group more savvy about disability because they aren't very savvy about it yet. Um, and Raja Kushalagar has kind of become a national leader in under undergraduate research for deaf and hard of hearing students. So. You know, it's like he's really moved far. Of course, there are three of our co-PIs, and they all have disabilities themselves. So it's like that's the new leaders. They're, they have disability. They lead. Um, then there's Access CS for All, which I started with Andy Stefik several years ago for K through 12 education. And so that's going on. And it's kind of a spinoff from that, this thing called CS Access which is a working group in the Computer Science Teachers Association, CSTA. And so they modeled themselves a little bit after uh, Access CS for All, which came out of Access Computing. So it's kind of like two levels of, it's a, a granddaughter of a grandchild of Access Computing. 
And then there's axis sig chi. And it was kind of cool. They took, they call it axis sig chi. They kind of stole that axis thing and put it in front, which is like, we approve of that. You know, that's, <laughs> I'm so happy they did that. And uh, we've worked together. And one of the leaders is right here, Jen Menkoff of Axis SIGCHI. And they're really active in making the SIGCHI, which is the human computer interaction community, more savvy and better with people with disabilities in terms of accessibility and everything else. So now I get to the future. OK. There's still underrepresentation uh, under of disabled people in computing at all levels. So I'm just going to show you some data. So this is pre-K through 12 disability data. So this is only in the United States. 15% uh, of students in this, in this group are under IDEA, which means they're identified as having a disability. And they have an IEP, or Individualized Education Program. 3% um, are under Section 504, and most of them are disabled. So that's 18% which is one out of five, approximately. So that's a lot. So they're coming upstream. They're coming to the colleges and universities. Students who took computer science course in high school, uh, this is from the State of Computer Science report in 2023, 10% were under IDEA. So there's a gap there between 10% and 15%. And 3% under Section 504. And there's no gap. So that's kind of encouraging. And so it's 13% total. So I feel like K through 12 is doing better than universities right now in terms of including students with disabilities. Uh, students with disabilities in the US. So this is university data. So and these numbers are kind of astounding. 20.5% 20 20 right, of undergraduates in 2019, 2020 identify as having a disability. And this is from a survey from the National Center for Education Statistics. Um, and then 10.7% for graduate students. So that's like really one out of five for undergraduates. Students registered with disability services is that 8%. And then we, we saw the Talby report, the 4.1% for undergraduates and 1.1% for PhD. So you can see there's quite a bit of underrepresentation in our field. So we need to do better. So there's a reason for access computing to continue. And finally, disability in the workforce. So this is from the US Department of Labor Statistics this year, or last year, 2023. So this is the workforce. This isn't like old people like me. This is people that are between 16 and 65. So about 4.7% of that workforce is disabled. Now, that means there's a lot of, in this group because there's a lot more disabled people are unemployed, don't have a job. So this is the actual people working. And 2.4% of the computing workforce is disabled. So there's a big gap there. So that needs to be filled. Um, and then the Stack Overflow survey, they don't seem to do this anymore. But in 2022, they had about 73,000 respondents. 3.6% have a disability but you identify as a disability, vision, hearing, typing, standing, and walking, sort of the categories that measure disability in the, in the US census. And then 20.7%, which is a big number, uh, identify as neurodiverse. So that group is the growing group, the neurodiverse group. And access computing has to do something about that and make sure they're included. Because that is really, if you look at the data for autism, in K through 12, it's more or less doubled in the last 10 years. And then finally, uh, disability, equity, and inclusion are under attack. And we know about that in Florida and Texas and you know, mostly southern states. Idaho, that's not a southern state. Um, so this is kind of sensitive. You know, it's like political. But I feel somewhat. Some comfort, some comfort in knowing that President Biden came out with this executive order in, uh, in June 2021, shortly after he became president. It's called the Executive Order on Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility in the Federal Workforce. So it included accessibility among everything. 
And so that is encouraging. Now, if we get the wrong president, they could executive orders can be canceled. So as a message there, who you vote for matters. So at least President Biden and his administration care about disability and include that, just like the um, BPC program include disability in its work with all these minoritized groups. So I guess my message for the leadership is continue to join with other minoritized groups to continue to advocate for DEIA, not just DEI. So we want to join in and make sure we're with those people and not try to be isolated and say we're not with those people. You can be good to us who have disabilities, but don't be good to those people that have other minoritized. They're black or Hispanic. So we want to be part of that group. We don't want to be separated. You know, there's a saying, I don't know how to say this right. They first came for X, then they came for Y, then they came for Z. So they haven't come for disability yet, but they will. So we want, we want to be with the right group. So finally, the acknowledgments. Um, the, the access to leadership we talked about earlier. Uh, they just do fantastic work. Um, the Do It staff who supported access computing, Lila, Eric, Eric I saw is here, uh, Terrell, I call him Terry, Terrell Thompson, Elizabeth, and Kayla. They might be on, on, on the YouTube channel. The Allen School leadership, they've always supported this. Even though it's not research and it's not making us famous, uh, you know, no Turing Awards for this. Um, Magda, of course, Hank Levy for many, many years. And even before, you know, David Notkin was there in 2005, and he was supporting this as well. And then, you know, I had to put down some students because students have helped me all the way through. Going back to the uh, game of life and image processing, I had students work with me. And here's just their pictures. If you were blind and had this, I have all their names in alternative text. But um, you can see Jim Fix and Tammy Vandergrift at the top, all sorts of people. Many of them have disabilities themselves. Um, many of them have PhDs. Uh, they're all over the country, either in academia or in industry. Um, so I'm really thankful for this group of students, this group, and probably two or three times this size. I couldn't get all their pictures. I didn't have enough time, but I can't even remember some of their names. And finally, my family, um, my two daughters and my wife, uh, Kate and Julia and Anne. And this was taken maybe about 10 years ago. So have I aged? <laughs> Not a bit. <laughs> anyway. That's my story. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we're at time, but let's take maybe one or two questions. Thank you, Richard. Uh, so it's, you talked about the deaf and hard of hearing uh, program. Uh, and it, it's funny, I, when I got to RIT my freshman year, there was Kaba, John, and a couple others that were in my class, computer science, and they all been through that program. They were like already ahead of me in like our foundation courses. And I was like, wait, how'd you, how'd you get ahead? They were like, we, we took this class of, with Ladner, and I was like, who's Ladner? And like, I was, that's how I learned about the program, and I definitely have FOMO, so I wish I was a part of that. Uh, but I'm curious, you know, like, I definitely saw the impact in them. They're all, you know, in great places. Uh, you know, it ended in 2013, so like, I'm just curious, like, kind of the transition there. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, the money ran out. <laughs> I mean, it used, you know, by the time after the first couple of years, we didn't really use much NSF money. We used primarily uh, the Gates Foundation and Johnson Scholarship Foundation money, and those were grants for a certain number of years. And it was just like 
that took away my whole summer, right? Nine weeks. And I really enjoyed it, but you know, you, there's time to move on, and, and that was kind of the transition. Now, several people have come to me and want to re, you know, get it back going again. And we have a replication package. We have all the things we did in a package that they can use if they want to. So it's something that can be brought back to life. And maybe you could do that. Huh? Yeah, that was a funny story about RIT. Awesome. Thank you. Given the time, let's take our speaker and take additional questions offline. Thank you.